This is engine principles test one. And just right after right following our how does an engine work anyway stuff. Uh, so basically, it's the first uh, nine questions are true false questions. A smart, a smart, excuse me, a spark ignition fuel injected engine requires six basic systems. Is that true or is it false? True. That's true. Now it's up to you to come up with what those six basic systems are, because I'm not going to spoon feed you everything. During the compression stroke, the piston moves down in the cylinder and the intake valve is open. True or false? False. That's false. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. So, did you ever think about how how often, I mean, how much of the time the valves are closed? During how many strokes are, all, are both the valves closed? Both the valves? Yeah, both the valves are closed during how many strokes? One, two. Wait a minute, what about One. compression One. and power? One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> compression and power, they're closed, right? You got that? No, I mean, they have to be, I mean, really. So Unless it's an Atkinson cycle engine. They're the ones of you that missed the hybrid uh, video, you know, will. I have got to go through that again. Are we doing anything about rotary engines? Uh, well, I've got some stuff on rotary engines. I actually have a really good video presentation from CDX that I'll show you on that. Yeah. It's just. I have this little, like, this little animated animation about how rotary engines work yeah. with the intake and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that's cool stuff. They don't have any valves either. No. All right. The connecting rod connects the crankshaft to the camshaft. Is that true or false? That's false. Yeah. A spark ignition engine and a compression ignition engine differ in the type of fuel they use. What's a compression ignition engine? Diesel. diesel. And obviously you're going to put diesel in a diesel and gas in a gas. Um, the air induction system keeps the engine at a safe and efficient operating temperature. No. The air induction system doesn't cool the engine. A piston stroke takes place when the piston moves from top dead center to bottom dead center. Or from bottom dead center to top dead center. That's true. true. That is a stroke. In a compression ignition engine, the piston compresses the air and fuel mixture until the spark at the spark plug ignites it. True. That's false. Compression ignition fires on compression. Let me briefly hit you with that. Whenever you squeeze air, you're getting two degrees Fahrenheit for every pound of compression. Got me? When you squeeze air, you're getting two to like that's why your you know your superchargers and your turbochargers have to push the air through an intercooler. Yeah. Because after you compress it, then you need to cool it if you want it to have a good tight bunch of oxygen molecules in each cubic inch of air. But if you squeeze, if you got a piston uh, that's got, if I've got 450 pounds of compression and you multiply that times two, how many degrees <coughs> Fahrenheit is that air going to be when that piston hits the top? 450 times two is what? 900 degrees. If you got 900 degree air and you Squirt some diesel fuel in there. It's going to light off. Okay, yeah, I, I it. But now, when the engine is cold, and the you know metal has a tendency, you know heat transfer has a tendency, uh, even though you squeeze that air, it's that the, all of the heat that's being generated by the air that's being squeezed is being soaked up by the because heat's what moves, right? It's being transferred into the cold metal of the pit, top, head of the piston and the engine because we're talking winter temperatures out here, and the second law of thermodynamics says if you park that engine and you leave it set there, the whole darn thing's going to be the same temperature. So you saw everything's going to be really cold. I mean, the pistons are going to be cold, the block's going to be cold, the water, I mean, the coolant's going to be cold, everything's going to be cold. All right, so what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to bust off some glow plugs. Which glow plugs, get, I got one in here somewhere. This is a glow plug right here. And if I took ground here and took power there, that sucker there would get red hot real fast. I mean, it just like scare you to death. Track the stuff. Yeah, yeah, that is a serious, that's one from a power stroke diesel, but that's a, that's a glow plug. All right, so long and short of it is, you're going to heat that up, and that's going to enable that diesel to fire up. Okay, so compression ignition engines are talking about diesel. Diesel. Anytime you hear about compression ignition. Spark, spark plug ignition is how much sugar gas. Yeah, that's right. Spark fired. Yeah. Compression fired versus spark fired is diesel versus gas right there. Oh. And, um, Okay, during the intake stroke of a four-stroke engine, the piston moves up in the cylinder. Think, guys, you just been through that. Does it move up during the intake stroke or down? No. Down. During the exhaust stroke, the piston forces the burned gases out through the open exhaust port. True. That's true. Now, number 10 is a multiple guess. Uh, if not tightly sealed, the piston clearance allows some of the compressed air fuel mixture to leak past the pistons. This is called blow-by. Actually, 
All engines have blow-by. They've all got it. So if not, if it has more blow-by, if it's, you know, if it's uh, the ringer wore out or something else is wrong in there. But blow-by is handled by the PCV system, positive crankcase ventilation system. Because if it didn't, like if the PCV system is stopped up and it can't breathe, it builds pressure in there until it blows all the seals. So if you ever see an engine on a vehicle that's got, you know, that's been road hard and put up wet and hasn't been maintained, and it's got all the seals blown, the valve cover gaskets are leaking, the oil pan's leaking, the front and rear seals are leaking, it's just leaking all over the place. I have seen mechanics replace all those seals without even checking the PCV system. And then it comes back in the next week and it has blown a bunch of those seals again, the weakest ones. And so what happens is you got to make sure you got a good operational PCV system that's taking care of that blow-by gas. You got me? You listen up. We're working on your neural pathways, okay? All right, then. There you go. All right, now we got uh, intake valves, exhaust valves, and combustion chamber all located where? Oh, I'm going to say cylinder. Cylinder head's a good answer, Willie. The measure of how much the air-fuel mixture is compressed during the compression stroke right. is compression ratio. Now on your old hot rod car, well on a diesel it's like 18 to 20 to 1. On a regular <coughs> gas burning car nowadays it's usually about 8 and 9 to 1, something like that. Uh, or on the older cars, like the old hot rod cars, it'd be 12, 13 to 1, something, you know. And uh, higher compression than that. And the old gasoline that we used to use back in the early 70s, before we had catalytic converters, had lead in it. You know a little sticker on the side of the gas pump, this gasoline contains lead, you don't see those anymore because they don't have lead in gas anymore. Like on some of the old gas pumps, like one of the docks, it'll say it contains lead. All those had to be required to say that. Well, that lead coats the valves and stuff and makes them last longer. <laughs> but they couldn't use that when they put catalytic converters on there because that lead would stop up the catalyst. So the lead had to go away when the catalyst came. They had to redesign the engine somewhat. Uh, also, I don't know if you guys knew it or not, but uh, the uh, usually supercharged and turbocharged engines have got stainless steel valves, you know, intake valves and stuff, so they're really hot. <coughs> I uh, just remember that. Uh, let me see. Uh, that's a sort of a generality. That's, not, that's a principle, not a precept, okay? Um, the measure of how much the air fuel mixture is compressed is the compression ratio. The cylinders, pistons, and crankshaft are all located where? D. It's in the engine block, right? Uh, just make sure you have all your head wrapped around this stuff. The air filter and the throttle body are parts of what? Air induction. The air induction system. There you go. The header pipe. Catalytic converter and muffler are parts of what? The exhaust system, that's right. You guys know about the catalytic converter, right? What does a catalytic converter do? Who can tell me about that? What does it do? What does a catalytic converter do? Huh? It actually, you've got uh, you got three gases coming out of the engine. We talk more about this in emissions. You got uh, CO2 is what you want, because that's what you're breathing out. If my car is breathing out the same thing I'm breathing out, I'm good with that. You got me? Have you ever been standing by the road, though, and have a truck or something go by, and it was an old, ratty old truck that somebody hadn't been maintaining, or maybe it's just real old, and it burns your eyes when you go by? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, it's terrible. Yeah. Don't worry about the chicken house and the dog and the Yeah. That one guy had a, a, an old 70-something Ford pickup truck that he would, you know, these long chicken houses? Well, if so many chickens die, and he has his insurance pays him apparently, so he would back his pickup in there and he'd leave it running. It was a pickup about like Daniel, right? And he'd kill about ten thousand chickens, and so he'd get a big insurance payout because he had a bunch of chickens that mysteriously died, and they could they're not gonna autopsy those chickens. They just said, well, we got a bunch of chickens that died, and so uh, so he buys he trades this truck in. He decides he wants a new truck because he's tired of the ratty old truck he's driving. So he trades it in on a at the time it was a brand new truck, a two thousand three F one fifty. So he parks it in the chicken house and he runs a whole tank of gas out and the chickens are still running around having a good time. They're not even sick. And so he brings it back fussing at the car salesman and this stupid truck won't kill my chicken. I want my old truck back. <laughs> this is a true story. I'm not making this up. You know, the truck won't kill his chickens. There's this other guy that had his GM car that he had. It was a fairly late model GM car. He decides he's going to commit suicide so he parks it in the garage, closes the door, cranks it up, and runs a tank of gas out, wakes up with a bad headache. <laughs> Couldn't kill itself running a car in a garage, you know. I used to, you could, mm. but I mean, because of the fact that it's breathing out carbon dioxide, you may go to sleep, but you wake up later, you know. <laughs> this kind of thing. So the long and the short of it is, the car is breathing out same thing we are. Okay, so I'm talking about this in emissions, but we want CO2. When we've got a perfect mix, we're putting out CO2, right? That's good stuff. When our exhaust gas analyzer, we want the CO2 to be high and everything else to be low. Okay, <coughs> the gasoline, the unburnt fuel, is hydrocarbons. That's HC. 
Now these little suckers here, they want to get married to two oxygen molecules. So you're putting the oxygen and you're putting the hydrocarbons in there together and you're hoping these guys will get married. This guy wants to have, this hydrocarbon guy, he wants to have two wives, right? So he turns into CO2 when he gets two wives, right? Well, if there's not enough oxygen to go around or there's too much fuel, you wind up with hydrocarbons and one oxygen molecule and now you got CO and that's nasty. You can't smell it, you can't see it, and you will surely die if you breathe it. The carbon monoxide is from a slightly rich air fuel mixture. When you run it through the catalytic converter, catalytic converter adds a molecule of oxygen to CO and turns it into CO2. And now everything's good again. Yep. See? So yep. when the catalytic converter is not working, you get CO gas? Mm -hmm. so you You're going to get some CO depending on your air fuel mix. Now your oxygen sensor, your oxygen sensor is in front of that. Your oxygen sensor is basically going to be keeping track of how that air fuel mixture is looking, and, it's ch and, the, and, the, and the PCM is constantly changing it to keep it at your 14.7 to 1, which is basically that's the old lambda, you know, reading, which is the as close as you can get to a perfect burn. It's going to give you CO2. Well, see, there's going to be mild variations, and there's going to be stuff going on. It can actually adjust this as air, as air leaks take place and other things go wrong. A certain that's what fuel trims are about. You got me? Okay, so this right here. If you've got way too much hydrocarbons in there, so that some of these guys don't have no oxygen to hook up with, you got HC. All right, now HC is the soot and the smelly gas that's coming out your exhaust. You know the black soot that you see? Carbon monoxide is colorless, odorless, and it's a killer. This is measured in parts per million. CO is measured in percentage of exhaust gas. Parts per million is what hydrocarbons measured in. And most cars now have almost no hydrocarbons, almost no carbon monoxide. There's also oxygen. There's also, for every gallon of gas you burn, you're making a gallon of water. And so that's why if your engine running too cold, the blow-by is going to have water in it. It's going to, you know, make you have water in your crankcase, kind of like y'all were discovering the other day. So if your engine running too cold, that's a consideration you need to pay attention to because you'll mess your engine up running it too cold. Anyway, catalytic converter adds two molecules of oxygen to this, one molecule of oxygen to CO, turns it into what we really like. It also separates the molecules of oxygen and nitrogen from one another that get married together when the cylinder head temperature goes, or I mean when the combustion temperature goes up over 2,500 degrees. EGR takes care of that and all this kind of stuff. We'll talk more about that when we get into the emissions. So, so what's the catalytic converter of the body? Hmm? What? What's the catalytic converter of the body? Oh, we, we don't need one. We don't need one because we don't use a, we don't work on internal combustion. You know, if you had a catalytic converter, you know, where do would we, it be? Do we produce that daily gas? It would probably be in your exhaust system, wouldn't it? Okay. All right. All right. Now, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A machine that turns heat energy into mechanical energy is a what? What the, does the word engine mean anything to you? Yeah. All right. Number 17 is prevents blow by. Of combustion yeah, gas. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm talking about the matching questions that I didn't give you all. That's okay. I stand corrected. I'm just so disappointed. All right. All right. Now that's the end of engine repair test one. Now I'm going to jump right in without even turning off my video camera. I'm going to jump right into engine principles, engine repair test two. Here, Jeremy, are you re are you burning this stuff in? You remember? It? Why did you pause before you nodded your head? Okay. 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 That's a good plan. You need to do that. Uh, con convection heat transfer occurs when heat is transferred from one object to another by direct contact. Do you guys know about the three different ways of uh, three different methods of heat transfer? You ever heard of those? We talk about them a little bit in your in your heat and air conditioning. And um, we got we got radiation, which is what. Comes from the sun. You're standing out in the sun, or you're standing in one of these infrared heaters. It's radiating. It's shining on you. Got it? Or maybe a hot light. All right. So we got <coughs> conduction. You touch something hot, you're going to pick up some heat. Right? Have you ever touched anything hot? Psh, ah. Jerk your hand back. That's conduction. Or if you hold something hot up against something that's not as hot that heat's got to get transferred from what's hot to what's not as hot because heat's what moves. Cold doesn't move, heat moves. Huh? 
Well, steam is basically going to be, well, if steam comes in contact, yeah. it's, you're basically going to do that. Yeah, so well, you can actually, all right, but listen to this, so convection. Now, these are sort of related because when heat is conducted into something, it's conveyed away. And the cool thing about steam is, if I've got me a, a barrel, a, a bucket of water out here, a boiler of water, and I've got a thermometer in it, and we're sitting here really close to sea level, a couple of hundred feet, whatever. And I put that torch under that bottle of water, and I got a thermometer in it. How hot can I get that water? Boiling point. And which is? 212. 212 is high as it's going to go. You ain't going to get no hotter than that. And it's actually still absorbing heat, you know. It takes 932 BTUs of heat to turn a pound of water into steam. Got me? All right. Uh, BTU is a British thermal unit, which is like burning a match. Got me? Okay, so you take your torch and you put it under there and you heat this thing up. The steam that's coming out of it, it's 212. Now this is getting into our air conditioning, see? So it basically is going to absorb heat while it's turning into steam, but the steam ain't going to be no hotter than the water. It's the same temperature. Now how can you change that? You can compress it. That's a good answer. You can put, a, put it in a pressure cooker. You know, don't put any nails and explosives in there or nothing, but you can put, yeah, you can put you know, pressure cooker on there, your little gauge, and it can get hotter without boiling because it's under pressure. However, there's another way you can do it too. Anybody know? It must be according to that design you gave us on the board yesterday, man. Because that, that's the evaporation, evaporation. Yeah, evaporation and con condensation and all that. Yeah, that's basically. But what I'm talking about here as far as your, you're talking about is plain old water, which water in a way is a refrigerant too. What if you poured some uh, antifreeze in it? Cool it. That raises the boiling point. You change the chemical composition of the water, you're going to raise the boiling point. Got me? You got that? Now you got you can also lower the freezing point by doing that, but you can you can pour alcohol in it and lower the freezing point, so it don't freeze as cold. You know, that's why, <laughs> that's why in, in in Russia they use vodka for brake fluid because brake fluid freezes. <laughs> you know, forty below zero or whatever, sixty below zero up there in Siberia. Kids still walk to school; they're real adaptable, but the cars ain't. So they got you drop a steel tool up there, it shatters like a piece of glass. Don't drop your snap-on wrenches up there on concrete if you're in Siberia. That's bad for the wrench. You just busted all the pieces. Okay. Welding uh, apparatus won't work up there either. You can't weld because it won't flow through the electricity. Won't flow through the cables at 60 below zero. Okay. Now then, they. Uh, so that's gonna be false then. Yeah. And then I forgot which question we was on. One. One. Convection heat transfer occurs when heat transfer from one object to another by direct contact. Actually, that's false because it's carried away. Convection is when you're carrying the heat away. Like the conduction is when the water goes into the cylinder head and absorbs the heat out of the cylinder head. Convection is when the water leaves and takes heat with it. You got me? Conduction heat transfer occurs when objects heat as a result of false. heat in the surrounding area. That's false too. Most surrounding, that's radiation. Most radiators are the downflow type. That's false too because most of them are going sideways nowadays. Downflow meaning the flues will be going this way. Like Daniel's truck has got a downflow radiator. You know the little the radiator cap on your truck is dead in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the tank's on the top and the bottom. But most of the radiators we got now are on the ends. I mean the tanks are on the ends. You got me? Mm -hmm. Got that? There you go. You said number two, I just wanted to say, you know, that con <coughs> when he said confection, See, we cook it, that's the kind of oven we cook in, mm -hmm. and it's not direct heat. It comes from all around Yeah. every area. Yeah, it's and actually being... Convection. Yeah, yeah. convection, it's it being not, carried in there, yeah. Yeah, it's not direct contact, yeah. it's, but the conduction is the one where you got to touch. Yeah, what, do y'all make uh, bread and stuff in there, or what? Uh, we, everything. Yeah, we that's cool taste, stuff. Everything. Yeah, I think my mother got one of those that somebody gave her, and she uh, cooks meat and stuff in there, come to think of it. Okay, most, uh, let's see, a fan drive clutch is controlled by the temperature of the air moving through the radiator. That's actually true, believe it or not. That is actually true. And look, I have one right here. All right, you see this? Now, this little strip right here is a bimetal strip, and it's hooked to a little valve inside this thing. Now, a lot of these things, you'll have a coil spring looking thing on them that'll be hooked to a little valve in there. This particular one, if you take a torch and you heat that up, it's going to change shape. It's going to bow out. And when it bows out, it's actually got this thing connected to it that changes the inside of this so that it's harder for it to turn. It's got glycerin in there and some blades and stuff like that. So as this well, air coming through that radiator is really hot, it's going to change the, what's going on inside here, and it's going to cause this have more resistance. The fan's going to turn faster and pull more air. Now, if you ever see one of these, it's locked completely up. 
it's going to sound like an airplane taking off, and you ain't going to have a lot of power. Boom! You know, you say, oh, man, my truck is so loud, it ain't already got no power. They say, okay, sh shut your truck off. They shut the truck off, and you grab this fan, you ought to be able to turn it like that. You know, the fan blades are hooked to this, and this is on a water pump. You ought to be able to turn it like that. If you're trying to turn it and it's solid, you say, you need a fan clay, it's going to be $140. They say, what? Can't we look for a problem somewhere else? You know, <laughs> that's what we've heard sometimes. But anyway, that's what this is. But it is the heat going through here is actually going to do that. Now, I've also got another one that has got electrically actuated innards for one of these. And they've got a, a wire harness hooked into the center of this. And so whenever you, the engine controller wants to drive the fan faster, based on its sensors, it can do it too. But it looks similar to this, but it's got wires coming off of it. So the heat will expand the blades and make them... No, the, actually the heat expands what's going on inside here. Okay, so See, this is actually like a... It's got, it's, it's got a little resistance now. See that? It's not, it's not a, a steady, an easy spin. I can't spin it. It's going to stop. But it actually gets stiffer on the inside. And on some of those, like on those RX-7s, like the rotary engines you're talking about, mm -hmm. back when I used to work at the dealership on those, when theirs kicked in, it was sudden. Boom! It was just, but these right here just slowly come in, you know, on those. But anyway, that's a fan clutch. And be aware of the fact that if that thing's locked up solid, you need to replace it because it's robbing power. They don't want to have to spin that fan all the time cutting that air. You notice that Crown Victoria over there that you were working on? It doesn't have a fan on the water pump. It's got an electric fan because the electric fan doesn't rob power from the engine like one that's driven by the belt does. See what I'm saying? That's a power robber. If you wanted to get better gas mileage on your truck, you could actually do away with that fan and put an electric fan on the radiator and you'd help your gas mileage some. A little bit. Wouldn't be a lot, but you'd help it some. All right. Huh? What do you mean, how would you convert it over? Yeah. Oh, All you got to do is take the water pump off and put bolts in there. I mean, not the water pump, but take the fan off the water pump and put shorter bolts in there so that you still got that pulley. And then you're going to put a fan on there like you buy at the parts house. Well, they've got a little uh, temperature switch that you can put somewhere like in the thermostat housing or whatever. You know, we've actually done it. We had a 68 Chevrolet convertible in here one time that belonged to uh, one of the instructor's sons. And all she wanted was the fan done away with and have two electric fans put on the radiator, and we did that, kind of like we got right there. All right, so except you got to have it. Uh, you can either run it all the time, or you can have it kick on only when the engine's, uh, you know, hot enough to make it happen. All right, let's look here. Let's hurry up. we got about 15 minutes. When the uh, engine is cold, the th closed thermostat valve restricts the flow of coolant from the engine. Is that true or is that false? That is true. Why do we do that? Why don't we want the coolant to just sit in the engine and not flow? You know, the water pump is not a positive displacement pump. It just kind of, it can just kind of whirl in there. But we do have coolant going somewhere, even though the thermostat's closed on just about every engine. And where is it going? Coolant. Coolant, yeah. Not, not antifree. I mean, not freon, but coolant. It's going back in the little reservoir. It? No, it's actually going through the heater core. Yeah, it's going to bypass the thermostat and go through the heater core. The okay. first place it goes is through that heater core because you want to get heat in there just as quick as you can. Okay. Got me? That's, that's, the okay. to, uh, that's the best way to circulate your coolant and all that those, when you first clean it up. Put it back in there and turn the heater on. Yeah, you want to turn the heater on. When you turn the heater on and your heater is warm, then you'll know that you got good. You ain't got an air-bound heater core. Got me? So when you're filling an engine up with coolant, you need to go ahead and turn on the heater. I'm going to turn it on hot. Mm -hmm. If the heater was working before, you know, and of course if the heater wasn't working, you're going to be sort of sunk on it. Turn on the heater, and whenever it gets, when that heater gets hot, you'll know that you don't have air trapped somewhere typically. Oh, okay. But you're also going to be monitoring your coolant level too. But that heater needs to be on where you can feel of it. Uh, when I had a 69 LTD, the water pump was starting to leak on it. And me and this girl that rode to school with me every day was, uh, we would be driving in the cold wintertime and there would be no heat. And I knew my car was getting low on coolant because there was no heat. <laughs> I mean, that's how I could tell, you know, in the, in the wintertime. And so I'd pull over here at Jeff Davis Grocery before he opened up, and I'd get out, and the hood latch was on the outside on those cars. Boom, pop the hood like that. And I'd take the radiator cap and pop it off and get out of the way, and it'd go like a geyser, you know, because I was just running clear water in it because it was leaking. And I'd get to Jeff's bucket and pour it full and put it back on. We'd have heat. The rest of the way school. I learned that when I was in high school. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the, the people that take it off and it sprays out and wets them, you know, you know, they weren't quick enough to get out of the way like I was. 
Of course, when you do that, it makes a mess, but I was out in front of the gas station anyway, so I didn't care. All right, now then, the, uh, let's see, the coolant has a smaller effective temperature range, but is less toxic as a 50-50 mix of propylene glycol, glycol and water. Propylene glycol, I'm not going to tell you that it's okay to drink the orange antifreeze, but propylene glycol, you can even look it up online, is not poisonous. Ethylene glycol is, propylene, propylene glycol is not. But uh, you know this little Mio stuff you spray in your bottles of water to make them taste good? Yeah. If you look at the back of it, they got propylene glycol in it, <laughs> which is the same stuff that's in that orange antifreeze. Now, don't drink the orange antifreeze because there's other chemicals in there that will kill you, okay? But the propylene glycol by itself, I mean, I actually looked that up when I saw that stuff had that in there. And I said, I don't know I'm drinking antifreeze. Good grief, you know? And then uh, if you look, it's like there's not any side effects. It don't hurt anything. It just tastes good. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. You know, they put it in antifreeze. In, in addition to everything else, but you dig it up online, man. See what you see. You know, I didn't find anything that told me that raised any alarm bells for me. I mean, there may be something out there that I didn't read, but uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. A pressure tester is a tool that can be used to determine leaks in the coolant system as well as to test a pressure cap. Oh, you ever seen this thing that you oh, pump? Six. Huh? True. Oh, six true. is actually true. Right. It's less toxic. But uh, when you you got this thing, it's uh, that has got a uh, a pump. That you can actually got a little adapter. You put a radiator cap on it. And you can pump it up and look at your little gauge and see if the cap is leaking or not. We don't have one of those things here, but what we do have is one that we pressure it up with shop air, with a regulated shop air, and then we can look for a leak. It's best to find a leak when the engine is cold. You don't want to have to work on a really hot engine because it's you know you got it blistering hot and got a lot of pressure in there to make a leak. Why not go ahead and let the engine stay cold, pump the pressure up that way, you know, and just do it on a cool engine. All right. Uh, Pyrometer is used to check the freezing point of coolants. That's false. Basically, a pyrometer is to check hot stuff. You know, it's to check the heat of the exhaust or that kind of thing. An infrared pyrometer is a contact type with a probe. No. If it's infrared, you're going to, you know my gun that I shoot in here? You shoot it, you know what temperature it is? I'll tell you something else are coming out. It's really cool as all get out. You know how in the movies, whenever you see they're looking through this infrared and you see the guys all warm, you know, the cool, cool is blue and warm is red? They've got those things that you can buy for automotive use now. You flip a little screen up, point it at the engine, you see the hot spots. As a matter of fact, on the Motor Age magazine that just came out, there's a picture of one of those on the front, and somebody's looking at the radiator hoses and, the, and all that to see what's hot. And occasionally, you can actually troubleshoot and by looking and see where the hot spots are by just scanning them with that thing. It's cool as all get out. Now, I don't know what one of those things costs, but I'll probably have to look into one. Uh, a relief valve that's stuck open will cause high oil pressure. That's totally backwards. If a relief valve is stuck closed, it'll cause high oil pressure. If you've got a relief valve that's stuck closed and the oil pressure goes too high, it can blow the oil filter slam off the car. Now, if you've got one that cranks it up and the oil filter goes poof and it blows off the car, and you put another oil filter on that you know is the right one, and you crank it up, it goes poof and it blows that one off the car, you may as well go ahead and find out where your relief valve is. If it's in the oil pump, you're going to need to replace the oil pump. If it's in the timing cover, you got to replace that, you know. So wherever the, oil, wherever the relief valve is, you got to find out where it is. You're going to do that. I've got an a oil pump over there off a of Toyota Camry. The oil pump, that right there by your hand. No, not that. That's an EGR valve. Pick that other thing up. You're scaring me. I thought, what do you, what do, you do? You go to another school or something? Pick that. That's it. That's it. That's it. You had your hand on it. The relief, that's an oil pump for a Toyota Camry, it's turned out, and it falls apart. Good catch. He ought to be a gunslinger. Yeah, like yeah, see that? The oil, the relief valve for the oil pump is in that uh, timing cover there over on the side. So if that, oil, if that relief valve, see that little, oh, no, yeah, good. that's where it's at. Okay, so we'll look at that later. Not a big deal. All right. All right, see, now let's go on down here. We got a little, we got a few minutes left here. The primary heat transfer device for the engine is what? The radiator. If the thermostat sticks closed, what will happen then? Engine will overheat. I'm going to tell you something, guys. When I was working, when I first started working on cars in the early 70s, we saw thermostats stuck closed, it seemed like all the time. I mean, that was usually what a thermostat would do, is it would stick closed. And now, you don't see one thermostat in a hundred that sticks closed. Most of them stick open, or they open too soon. A lot of the times you'll see a thermostat, you won't see nothing wrong with that thermostat. But it will wind up, you know, being opening too soon. Or the spring gets weak or something changes about the wax element. I don't know what it is. But if you've got one that's running too cold, the thermostat's what's wrong with it. In almost every case. Now, this one guy, the thermostat will make it run too cold by 
open it too soon, the spring will break or it'll come apart. Anytime you got, or if somebody pulls a the thermostat out, now occasionally you'll find some yo-yo that will be a self-proclaimed automotive expert 